Yeah, so please, in this uh, hopefully less formal uh, uh, presentation, you know, please do not hesitate to interrupt or st ask questions. Uh, if you've been here on Monday, uh, uh, then what, sh what you will get to hear is, so to speak, the observational uh, correspondent on many of the topics which we then discussed. Uh, but of course, I will give you the background so you don't have to have been at the, the Monday uh, uh, little workshop. So what we're trying to do is to understand uh, the evolution of uh, galaxies, uh, star forming galaxies, uh, through and at the peak of cosmic star formation, which happened about 10 billion years ago. So that was when most of the massive systems really formed for the first time. And up to that point, there was sort of a build-up phase. And since that point, there has been sort of a winding down phase. And I'll try to uh, tell you what we now feel we understand uh, in terms of the empirical information, what, how this all came about. Now, this, this work really involves many of the big machines we now have in astrophysics at our disposal. I'll show you a lot of work from, from this telescope here, the ESO VLT. Uh, equipped uh, uh, initially with an instrument we built at, at MPE doing integral field spectroscopy in the near infrared, uh, then equipped with a laser guide star to sharpen these images uh, so that one can get, go at kiloparsec resolution uh, in situ measurements of these high redshift objects. More recently, we've been contributing to another machine uh, of 24 symphonies called KMOS, which we uh, are using now for uh, highly multiplexed integral field spectroscopy, and I'll tell you what we've been finding there. Uh, other than the uh, rest frame optical work in the near infrared, we've been using uh, the Hubble Space Telescope to get at the stellar uh, light and stellar mass distributions at high resolution. Uh, a very new part of the story in many ways is the fact that uh, millimeter interferometry now has uh, matured so much that we can actually hope to observe the same objects which we are studying in the, in the near infrared and optical, uh, also in millimeter waves, in particular to observe uh, molecular line emission in CO, which is giving us information on the molecular content. And then this machine, where we build one of the three uh, focal plane instruments called PAX, uh, was the Herschel uh, ESA satellite mission, which has been a great success. Unfortunately, it ran out of helium a few years ago, so now we are only analyzing the archives. But it's gotten, given us an enormous amount of information on calorimetric uh, data, basically, on total star formation rates. Uh, and dust content of these high redshift galaxies. So what I will do in this talk is to bring all of this information as best as I can together. So it will be quite a bit of uh, complex uh, information from different directions. Naturally, such an effort over many years uh, involves many people. Uh, the key leaders in our group have been Natasha Furster Schreiber, Linda Tacconi, uh, Dieter Lutz, and Steinbeutz. But then over the years, postdoc students have joined, and we have struck uh, you know, long-term collaborations, for instance, with Amiel Sternberg, who is sitting there in the back. Um, and, and basically, with, 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 these, uh, with this uh, growing team, then you know, getting this different information uh, together. So here is the overall picture of the evolution of uh, cosmic star formation rate, here plotted as a function of redshift, and then uh, up on top as a function of look-back time. So we know from all of these different pieces of work, which has been most recently summarized in this paper here, that between the current epoch and about 10 billion years ago, the average uh, per volume star formation rate in the universe increased by about a factor of 20. Before that time, it dropped. Uh, and that's basically this build-up phase, this accretion phase where actually the first galaxies uh, came together. And this epoch here sort of is characterized by the full maturization of the galaxy populations. <coughs> so that's the star formation rates. 
At the same time, of course, there is the issue of the black holes. And in these different colors, green, uh, bluish, and also red here, you see what people feel now they can say about the evolution of the growth of uh, black hole accretion activity. And to first order, you know, these two things mirror each other. And so that's the uh, famous co-evolution. And of course, we would like to understand <coughs> how did this all come together? Um, why was there so much star formation here? And it's not just star formation rate per volume, it's actually star formation rate per mass, also in the sense of uh, a given galaxy of a given mass at that epoch produced you know, 50 to 100 times more stars per unit time. So the Milky Way mass, a Milky Way mass galaxy, which t today produces two stars per, per, per year, it would have produced uh, maybe you know, 50 to 100 uh, stars per year. So we want to understand why that is. Is that because star formation in this epoch was more efficient? Was it more violent? Uh, or the most simple explanation is there was just more stuff to, uh, to make stars out of. So I'll, I'll tell you about this. And of course, this, this uh, empirical studies are mirrored by enormous progress, as we've seen on Monday. Uh, on the theoretical side, on the, on the simulation side, where of course we know for some time that the uh, large-scale structure is an important part of here, the dark matter backbone <coughs> and the filaments and the cosmic web, and then the uh, formation within dark matter halos uh, of, of uh, young galaxies. Uh, the expectation had been for many years that you would form disk galaxies in this process because, of course, there's angular momentum in the dark matter halos. And if the baryons share that, well then, uh, you know, as they fall into the potential wells of the dark matter, they would then form uh, disk galaxies. Uh, but then also, of course, because the densities were high, interaction rates are high, you would expect that there is uh, interactions between galaxies leading to mergers. And we know in the local universe, mergers uh, can, you know, by compressing gas, uh, lead to enhanced star formation efficiency uh, or, or smaller depletion time scales. So the, the, uh, I would say 10 years ago, most people would have bet that in fact this, this process here on the left side is probably a leading process to explain why there is such a peak. I should say we are now leaning towards saying, well, both occur, but this is probably equally important, if not more important. <coughs> So what we've learned from many imaging studies with the Hubble Space Telescope and ground-based uh, imaging studies in the optical, deducing the, uh, the, the, in, in several bands the spectral energy distributions of the stellar populations, then inferring from that also the star formation rates and the, the stellar masses. Uh, so we've learned that uh, across cosmic time to at least redshift two and a half, and some people believe now to redshift four, uh, there is what is called a star formation main sequence. So a, a relationship between the stellar mass of the galaxy and its star formation rate, which is a slightly sublinear, uh, uh, linear, sublinear power law in these, in these uh, two quantities, which to first order uh, has the same slope and the same behavior at all these different redshifts. Okay, so it's a, uh, it's a similar distribution at different, at different redshifts, out to at least redshift two and a half. But the amplitude, the mean amplitude of this, of this star formation uh, main sequence is increasing like one plus z to the 2.5th uh, power or so. So that's what I said before, per galaxy, per stellar mass, uh, much more star formation in a given galaxy, uh, while the galaxy population as a whole uh, has been growing uh, around this main sequence. An important question uh, is, of course, to what extent what's happening here is sort of a equilibrium process, and to what extent there are strong variations, which one might call star bursts. And we know in the local universe that star bursts, say triggered by interactions, would push galaxies, of course, uh, up in star formation rate because you know, star, star, uh, ga the gas is more concentrated and, and maybe also star formation is more efficient. So uh, the work with Herschel has shown that at all redshifts up to you know, two and a half, or this could be reasonably done, 
In fact, uh, uh, only about 1% in number and 10% in, 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 in star formation rate lies in this uh, excess outlier population. So that's a very important finding, uh, surprising, and perhaps uh, to some extent totally unexpected because people initially felt uh, that the outlier population may have been the sort of clue to understand all of this. We now think that in this log normal distribution here with 0.3 dex scatter uh, of the main sequence, that's, that's where on average uh, the, the, the action happened. So why would the outliers lie on the left-hand Well, they would not be plotted here, no, but they would be above it. On this color? So these colors is just the main, the line, so that the fit line of the, of the trend, uh, okay? So that just, that just shows you that with, with redshift, from redshift zero, which down here, to redshift two and a half, how that amplitude increases yeah. off, the, off the mid ridge line. Yeah. And so now I'm discussing the scatter in this, right? Yeah. So the excess is the blue part above this uh, ridge? So the excess would be above here, okay? Yeah. Above the, above the ridge. The ridge is here, yeah. right, right here. And then you know, if we are asking, so to speak, how much, how much energy is up here versus in the, uh, on the main sequence. And do you have this only at redshift Well, as I said, people are beginning to push this beyond. Uh, in terms of the HST work, uh, Samples are getting fairly incomplete, especially in spectroscopy, if you want redshifts, uh, beyond redshift two and a half. Maybe so you can say a word at least to the students about how you estimate the star formation rate. What's, what's the okay. policy for star formation? Right, so, so the, 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 the state of the art techniques are a combination of things. So if you start with an imaging survey, like HST-based imaging surveys, you take several bands. Uh, rest frame, ultraviolet, to, if you can, into the infrared. And then you do stellar population synthesis modeling on the, on the spectral energy distributions, which if you know the redshift, which is a, good start, is a good, very good starting point, can give you fairly reliable estimates of the stellar mass, always assuming some initial mass function which you have to input to the system. You cannot estimate that as well. Uh, but you can get a very solid, I would say, 0.15 dex uncertainty uh, estimate of stellar mass and also a star formation rate, okay? That can be more tricky if it's a very dusty system and so forth, but in sort of the average run-of-the-mill galaxy, perhaps two plus minus 0.2 dex, you can estimate the star formation rate. To make that more precise, you want to make, you want to, ascertain how much dusty star formation there is. Obviously, if you have a lot of dust, then the amount of UV emission, which would be you know, proportional to the star formation rate because they're sampling young massive stars, uh, would be suppressed. Now, you can try to extract that also in the spectral energy distribution, which people try to do, but it's then becoming fairly degenerate. So the, the, the state-of-the-art method, therefore, is trying to assess how much dusty star formation there is by, go, by measuring in the infrared. Because something which is absorbed in the ultraviolet by dust typically would then be re-emitted as a sort of a quasi black body radiation uh, in the far infrared. So the best thing you can do, in fact, is sort of combine an estimator in the ultraviolet or H alpha would also be good. Uh, and that's the unextincted part. And then you get, a, get an estimate directly from the peak of the, the dust uh, emission in the far infrared. So that's where Herschel has been extremely helpful because that's, a, as I said, a calorimetric. Anything which gets lost in the ultraviolet comes out in the far infrared. The problem is that as you go to high and higher redshift, uh, uh, the Herschel work, as good as it was, could not identify and could not see individual galaxies below about this level here. So then you have to go into stacking, uh, but you basically stack uh, galaxies and you compare, making certain assumptions, these stacked uh, spectra. 
You can also use mid-infrared emission, the Spitzer, for instance. Uh, they, go, they generally go deeper, but the mid-infrared is not at the peak of the output, so you have to then make an extrapolation uh, from the mid-infrared to the far-infrared. That can be tricky, in particular if you have AGNs in the system. So, so one is basically trying to combine uh, different ways of making the estimate, enhancing, if you can, the always available UV optical information with the more secure but you know, rarer uh, far infrared and, and, uh, and mid infrared techniques. Is that giving a good enough uh, short explanation? All right. Um, so, another component in these galaxy populations is what's below this main sequence. That's called the quiescent population, obviously low star formation rates, the red sequence, and that's where, in fact, all the galaxies end up in the end, anyhow. So there seems to be a speed limit, so to speak, a mass limit uh, at all redshifts, which is around 10 to the 10.9 in stellar mass or 10 to the 12 in halo mass. And if you look at these uh, mass functions, stellar mass functions at different redshifts, you see there is sort of an exponential cutoff, a Schechter mass, which is more or less constant in the star forming population. And it's also the same as in the and to first order as in the quiescent popu uh, population. And that tells you that something happens around that mass for field galaxies. I'm not discussing here dense environments, I should say. There you have additional effects in the field where interactions between galaxies are relatively rare and satellites do not interact strongly with, main, with, the, with the main galaxy. In the field, you seem to have a a characteristic mass, a, a Schechter mass, above which the probability to, maintain, to, to, to be on that main sequence becomes exponentially lower. And so then uh, that is interpreted to mean that there is a transition to this uh, red sequence. And now what, what happens, of course, over time is that there will be a flow, obviously, of galaxies from the from the, from the you know, star forming population into this population. And that means as you wait over, over cosmic time, ever more red galaxies are, are building up and the red sequence becomes ever more numerous. At redshift two and a half, that was about the first time when you can identify red sequence populations. So that's another reason, you know, going beyond this for technical and also cosmic reasons, uh, it's not so clear what the story is, okay? But, Starting at around redshift two and a half, that's, that's sort of basically the, the story. By the way, the plot on the right hand side, the vertical shift, the, it, the same curve just shifts vertically, or in the high mass galaxies, the fractional change is smaller than in the. That's right, that's right. In fact, oh, so that, was one, uh, that was one of the very early on surprises. So, from large scale structure and the C cosmic <laughs> dark matter paradigm, you would not have expected that, right? Because you would have expected there, dark matter, right, and hierarchical merging, that you start with small units initially, and then over a long period of time, giga years, you would then build up the big things. So when the first survey started, people were finding all these big galaxies, star forming galaxies. So that was not at all expected, okay? Now, there was a period where this was called, you know, basically anti-hierarchical, uh, you know, star formation. We now understand this to be sort of having to do with the speed at which galaxies grow. Basically, because early on there was a lot of accretion. Galaxies could form very quickly, grow very fast. And so that's why, you, you know, you push through from small to large at a very fast rate. But then they stop. Well, because they always have to, you know, they, they all have to obey the speed limit, the mass limit, so they drop out of the game, right? And while at low masses, there were, you know, constant production of, of low mass systems. So then if you look back, uh, then all of a sudden you see all these low mass systems at low redshifts, right? And you see some high mass objects which you wouldn't have expected at high. That doesn't mean that there weren't any low mass galaxies uh, at high redshift. They just grew very rapidly to become a high mass. It's, it's not as simple as one might have thought. Now, on Monday, we discussed some of the physical processes which happen here in baryonic uh, physics, so to speak. So this is not dark matter, uh, which to a significant extent were not known and also not discussed in early work, which clearly form now the pillar of sort of the, 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 the theoretical framework within which we are working. 
The first one is that the shape of galaxies. We heard some of that about, about that on Monday. Here is perhaps an extreme, but one example of a moderate mass, uh, log m star of about 10.5 in solar units, a galaxy at redshift two and a half, and you see that it's highly clumpy. Very, very clumpy. Now the resolution we have available in HST or adaptive optics is modest, so uh, these clumps are just resolved, so not super resolved. The expectation would be if you have a 30 meter telescope, this would of course have you know, lots and lots of lots substructure, including perhaps gigantic clusters. Yeah, gigantic clusters, globular clusters probably, <coughs> even forming within them. So these gigantic star forming clumps are sort of a characteristic. If you look at this morphologically, then of course the first impression is this doesn't look like at all like a modern galaxy. So in fact, if you look at the early HST imagery discussion on these kinds of clumpy galaxies, most people interpreted this as merger systems. Because if you use any kind of symmetry uh, conditions on such image, you would say, well, this does not look like a spiral galaxy. Yet the information I'll give you you know, in this talk, and which is solidifying by the minute, I should say, is this is a beautiful spiral galaxy, so to speak, a, disc, a rotating disk galaxy. Uh, the reason it doesn't look like is because A, it's much more turbulent, and B, these clumps form through gravitational instability, we believe, and become so enormously dominant. The next ele important element is the accretion rate of material both in terms of just you know, smooth uh, gas coming in along the cosmic web and then uh, being channeled into the galaxies, as well as a spectrum of structures from you know, sometimes in a galaxy like this, every three giga years, on average you would expect a major merger, that is a collision, an interaction with a system of your mass to maybe a third of your mass. Uh, and then uh, maybe every two giga years, you would expect at this redshift a collision which, which, with, with something which has a tenth of your mass. And then there's a spectrum, of course, from you know, these minor mergers to things where you don't know what's the difference between smooth accretion. And, but the redshift depends on that, uh, as far as we can map it out, uh, follows very much like what you would expect from dark matter uh, evolution, large-scale structure evolution, namely a, a accretion rate which is proportional to the mass of the system, and then a redshift term, one plus e cubed, roughly speaking. So you see immediately, divide m dot by m, that gives you a rate, okay, or one over that, a time. So that means, you know, there's this is a very simple thing where you have an accretion time during which the system doubles its mass, say. And that goes like one plus g cubed, and so that means at high redshift, uh, these galaxies really are receiving a lot of, of accretion. And in fact, say at redshift two for this object, the mass doubling time scale is sort of a uh, little, little bigger than a uh, half a giga year. Okay, so that's a very rapid uh, growth process. Then uh, let's talk about gravitational instability. So instability uh, theory on these objects here has to take into account that, as I will tell you later, these objects are highly gas rich. So a modern galaxy in terms of gas in the inner parts has maybe 10% or a little less gas. So that's a minor perturbation. So the, the potential is totally determined by the stellar potential. At high redshift, the gas fractions may be as high as 70%. On average, on average, galaxies of that mass would have 50% at that redshift, okay? So here we are talking about self-gravity, and if you take a gaseous disk and sit it, and sit it uh, you know, on the table, ha give it some rotation, then all of a sudden, of course, all scales are unstable to gravitational instability from the gene scale, which is very small, all the way to the larger scale, above which then rotation stabilizes the system. And that largest scale, which is a ring instability, is called the tumor instability. And that uh, tumor instability uh, defines a parameter, uh, a unitless uh, parameter Q, uh, below which the system is unstable. And if you write that down, uh, then you'll find that if Q is about one, so the system is marginally unstable, there's a proportionality between the aspect ratio of the system, HZ is the Z scale height over the disk length, or the velocity dispersion to the rotation velocity, which is proportional to gas fraction. 
That simple physical relationship turns out to have ver very dramatic consequences in all of what you will be hearing. Because as you go to higher redshift, I told you the gas fractions to be shown uh, increase with redshift. And that means systems, if they are near instability, must get more turbulent and they must get thicker. That is to be proven that this is true, but that is what the theory would tell you. And indeed, if you go to the scale at the numbers here in the system out here, you would expect that these clumps, which in the local universe are 100 parsec or a few hundred parsec size, are more than a kiloparsec. So these really big structures which still collapse because there's so much gas. And the masses of these systems, because of these large gas fractions, become very massive. I mean, this, this object here actually has almost 10 to the 10 solar masses. It's an extreme object, it's a, but it looks like a, you know, a single clump, really, but has a mass almost like a galaxy, but is part of a galaxy and is rotating with the rest of that galaxy. The next part of the story, which we've uh, uh, all agree, must play an important role is ejection of material back out of the galaxy. This does occur in the local universe, of course. We see it in quasars, in AGNs, and we see it in starburst galaxies. But at high redshift, it's ever common. Okay, almost anything, any galaxy you look like has some sort of an outflow. And I'll tell you about what types of outflow we see and what they might be triggered by, for instance, by the star formation. Okay, and there are now various techniques of looking at this. For instance, with absorption UV spectroscopy, you see basically the uh, outflowing material as blue shifted absorptions. Or, that's more recent, we can look at the ionized gas in H alpha and look for broad under, under, underneath the star forming uh, profiles uh, for broad emission lines, which are indi indicative of these outflows. Now, if a gas-rich uh, galaxy is left to its own purposes, there is a very substantial amount of friction in the system, much higher than in the local universe, basically because the communication length is very large. Mm, and that's the tumor length. And that means that there can be energy ex uh, angular momentum exchange, very efficient angular momentum exchange in these systems, such that in a local galaxy, the interaction of, uh, you know, change of angular momentum occurs, if not with partners on the outside, through spiral arms and large-scale features in the galaxy. Here, in fact, the clumps interacting with, uh, with each other are very efficient in removing angular momentum. And so starting with early work in the late 90s, where this was basically a theoretical prediction, not of great interest to most people, but now it's become very, very relevant we, you can show from first principle that lead, this leads through substantial mass influx on time scales of less than a giga year, okay? And that might provide theoretically a channel to build up bulges uh, without having to disturb the, the system by an external per perturber. So then overall, the picture we are discussing here is one where you have this star formation sequence which we discussed the amplitude change you would understand as basically the rate changing at which uh, gas is coming into the galaxy, as I told you. And then galaxies m most of the time move from low mass, where they start, to high mass along the main sequence. Okay, they just grow along the main sequence. They can have perturbations, so they can move up because they had a little interaction by a small amount due to a minor merger, by a big amount uh, because you have a major merger, or because you know, one of the feeding lines in the cosmic web dries up, so to speak. So all of that happens, but on average, they're growing fairly peacefully along this uh, almost unit slope until they reach the speed limit. And then something happens. And what happens, we, we really all want to understand. Is it perhaps that they then must have a major merger, so they shoot up, and once they had the major merger, con convert themselves into an elliptical galaxy, we see that in the local universe, they then drop all the way, plunge down to the, to the, to the red sequence, or do they dry up somehow because they don't get enough gas anymore? 
or are there other mechanisms from the inside which drive the gas out? So I'll spend uh, some time at, towards the end of the talk or in the middle of the talk to show you what we've been learning on this just from empirical information. Of course, theory has opinions, but they are sub, you know, subgrid models, subgrid recipes where people have thoughts what they, what they have. They put it in and they get something out. We're trying to also, of course, find uh, uh, to what extent this is justified from from, from direct empirical evidence. Now let me describe what we have been doing. So here's, here's a SED, a spectral energy distribution, of one of these galaxies. You see there's the optical part, that's the stellar emission. Then you see typically 10 times stronger in, in nu l nu, the re-emitted ultraviolet as a dust uh, peak. So for these galaxies we're talking about, most of the energy comes out in the far infrared. Only 10% typically comes out here, although it's been all generated here. Then you see a plethora of lines here. Uh, they are the optical lines, a strong optical line like H alpha, auction three and so forth, which of course gives us a lot of information. Then as you go into the infrared, uh, there's very valuable lines, uh, fine structure lines, which we unfortunately do not have yet good access to the high redshift. And then in the millimeter, submillimeter range, we see this fence of lines. That's mostly due to carbon monoxide, CO, which is a good proxy, at least qualitatively, of molecular hydrogen, which of course is the main tracer of gas, so to speak. So in, dense, in the dense state, most of the gas is in H2. H2 doesn't have an electric dipole moment. Therefore, you cannot really see it very well observationally. So you have to replace this by proxies. And one of the proxies is carbon monoxide. And another proxy actually is the dust, which, which is in this uh, far infrared emission. So we've been undertaking various ways of tackling uh, this, so to speak, this information. In the, in the near infrared, we've developed this tool called uh, you know, integral field spectroscopy where you have a uh, way to get spectra uh, as a function of the two-dimensional uh, image for each position uh, simultaneously. Very efficient way. If you put that behind adaptive optics, you can then actually get very high resolution, very sensitive information. So that's that's done with this, for the first time was done with Symphony on the, on, the, on the VLT and later on we conducted various surveys, SINs, ZZ, SYNF and so forth, exploiting with this single unit. So you observe one galaxy at the time. I should tell you to get good information, that's very costly. On a big telescope even you, you integrate for 10 hours, 20 hours on one object. Get exquisite information but not, not much statistics. So in fact, uh, uh, the advent very recently of this machine, which provides 24 symphonies at the same time. What you see here is the, the, you know, the focal, place, focal plane of the telescope, and you see all these different arms, like angles, anglers coming in. In each one of those is feeding an IFU, and so you can move these these IFUs around in a field of seven by seven arc minute and observe 24 objects simultaneously. Very, very powerful instrument. The one disadvantage is it doesn't have adaptive optics. So while this machine here gives you exquisite uh, resolved imagery, here you're basically looking at a more integrated kind of information. On the long wavelength side, we've been exploiting the increasing power of millimeter interferometer, as I mentioned already, initially and, and, and primarily, I would say, especially for surveys, we're using the, in, uh, the Plateau de Bure millimeter interferometer on the uh, site in southern France here. This machine initially had six telescopes of 15 meter diameters. Uh, this year, we, we added the seventh, and it'll grow to hopefully 12. Uh, now, this is used to be, until recently, the most powerful instrument. Now we have ARMA, which is uh, a super telescope with 50 uh, uh, telescopes, 50 12 meter telescopes, uh, but it's highly oversubscribed. So we will have to see uh, how soon we can do surveys with, with ARMA, rather than sort of a few uh, individual observations, but that is coming. So we've been undertaking, you know, some of the leading work here in this field for the first time looking at the same objects, 
which we know from the optical also in the millimeter to look what, how much gas there is. Then I mentioned, and then I mentioned the, the Herschel work, which has basically been measuring how much power is coming out in the, in the far infrared. And of course, the HST is sort of delivering the, the base of all of this. Yeah? So the very large samples from the HST with 100,000 galaxies gives us the overall statistics. And then we are picking representative subsamples, so to speak, with the more expensive follow-up techniques, which where you cannot possibly hope to get to this number. What redshift you think you get? Would be, or you aim at 2.5? Well, we have aimed at 2.5 in the, in the optical. The, the, the reason is largely technical, Ari, because adaptive optics, uh, you know, works bet the better the longer wavelengths you go to. However, when you go beyond two and a half micrometers, the uh, thermal emission from the Earth's atmosphere and the telescope and so forth, you know, kills your sensitivity. You don't want to go beyond that unless you go to a space telescope, okay? I mean, JWST will do that. Um, H alpha moves out of the band beyond redshift two and a half, and H alpha is sort of the unique in line you want to look at. Oxygen three is okay, but it's not as, you know, straightforward to interpret as, as H alpha. So there are, there are, unfortunately, there are some non-scientific <laughs> technical constraints here. But then I mentioned to you also that, you know, going beyond redshift two and a half, actually, we don't know whether the picture which I'm going to describe is still holds, uh, just on the basis on the imagery. So the, the, what, what, you, what, you, what I'm trying to get across here is by using this multi-approach technique, you're getting just more than the stellar light, which is what most people have been using. The stellar light, the UV, the B band, so to speak. That's, that's what most people, we're trying to convert this information into physical information. So for instance, star formation rate, as we already discussed. So for instance, stellar mass. Uh, so you have to actually do analysis on the HST imagery to then get from the observed uh, plane into this physical plane. A very important element, as you will see, is kinematics. Uh, with, with the H alpha and the IFUs, and also the millimeter interferometer, you actually can access the motions, uh, both whether or not there is rotation, but also whether there are these outflows and what the dispersion is in the gas and so forth. So that's a very important part. Um, and then, of course, the, the nebular physics, abundances, uh, metallicities, and so forth. So all of this information we are trying to add into the pool, so to speak, of then actually having phys a broad, broad set of physical uh, elements to interpret these galaxies. And, and just one, one aspect on KMOS, which I already mentioned, is that uh, here you have the main sequence again, uh, 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 redshift point uh, 7 to 2.7. So this is the HST. Uh, frequency distribution in contours. So when we, with symphony and sins, you see after about eight years of work, that's what we assembled, about 120 galaxies, painstakingly, so to speak, over all these years. In two years of KMOS, that's what we've done. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what a multiplexed, a highly multiplexed machine does for you that you can you know, just you know, incredibly increase the statistics. Of course, let's keep in mind, for these, we have adaptive optics. And so we know the fine scale information. And so it's, it, this we do not know with KMOS. How many spectra you get uh, one scene? About 1,000. Oh. For each galaxy, 1,000 spectra, yeah. yeah there's, in KMOS, there's three spectrometers, each feeding a 2K by 2K detector. Yeah. So what have we learned? Let's start with the morphology. So again, I'm plotting much of this in, in this stellar mass, star formation rate plane, and the main sequence is here, this gray line, and then there's this scatter of 0.3. So this is actually, so to speak, the imagery. Basically, you see uh, you know, a bunch of these uh, uh, star-forming galaxies. You can see immediately, well, they have different shapes. They have their clumpy, asymmetric. You wouldn't, you wouldn't from this appearance, uh, believe me that I say these are rotating disk galaxies, okay? It's just not what you get from the optical, the, uh, the appearance of the imagery. Uh, however, Some of them are red, 
look sort of these red disks. Yes, yes. We will bring order into this array, and in fact, uh, there is here various effects happening. One of which is the the quenching, yeah, and the quenching is drying out from the inside out. So you will see bulges are forming, which then through various mechanisms dry out the disk, which then turns it down, uh, and so there's various processes we believe in action. So the first thing I can say is. Actually there, is actually, there is order in this when you look at the surcage indices. So if you go ahead in the, in the images, in the HST images, this is work by Stein Woods, at different redshift bins, so that's local SDSS, and then these high redshift samples. And for each galaxy, you fit a surcage index distribution, which is here indicated as a color where n equals 1, an exponential distribution is blackish, and a, a cuspy, n equals 4, would be reddish. And you could immediately see that here, what, what, what you know, of course, already from textbooks, is that in the local universe, uh, the star-forming galaxies are disks. The massive star-forming galaxies are disks with n equals 1. And then as you go into the you know, into these galaxies down below, well, they have high pro profiles which are sharper. Uh, interesting enough, we also know that the galaxies above the main sequence also have that. Okay? They're also sharper, probably requiring dissipation. Now, this picture actually holds to high redshift. So although those galaxies out here, as you see there, totally different appearance, no spiral arms, no beautiful structures, they adhere to the same thing. The main sequence, which is this white line, is the location of n equals 1 galaxies to redshift 1. So these are, formally speaking, uh, morphological, uh, morphological uh, disk distributions. So that means that the main sequence is not only a star formation property, it's also a structural property. Okay? So structure and and, and star formation properties are coupled. They are too at high redshift. Of course, the, the quiescent population is cuspy, very compact, uh, by the way, and also the uh, population up here becomes more, more cuspy. So that's the first thing. The next thing is, once you go from the imagery and say the rest UV images, which are very, very you know, irregular, clumpy, and so forth, to the inferred stellar distribution, the inferred stellar distribution is typically much smoother. Okay, so the, the clumps here, so to speak, uh, are a product of a combination of star formation properties and extinction variations, and the underlying stellar distribution is actually much more regular than you would have thought. So I can show you this. So here we start with the images, and now we go into the computed uh, stellar mass maps. Here, here are the images, and here are the stellar mass maps. You see, um, see you know, a fairly simple pattern occ occurs uh, here. At, and I, I should say these are scaled in a way that it's absolute scale. So in fact, so red is higher stellar mass density. Okay, they're all on the same scale. So you see that as you go from the left to the right, you see all of a sudden central blips occurring. Yeah, bulges are growing. So there's obviously growth of bulges, and the mass fraction of bulges are very substantial at these redshifts. So a typical 30 to 50 percent uh, bulge to total uh, fractions occurring. But the, in the slope, uh, the neutral slope, that's measured in the outer part of these uh, images? I mean, because that, that was a systematic in, uh, increase going down, not along the main sequence. What do you, what do you? In the previous plot that you showed the colors based on, yeah, this, this, this one. So this one is the, the Cersic index. Okay. So the Cersic index is, made, is not dependent on the presence of the bulge. Well, okay, I mean, so if you go to the massive, uh, massive side here, you will see uh, that the Cersic index indices increase. Now, of course, the area is still dominated by the outer parts. Uh, I mean, if you, if you fit a double surcage, which Philip Lang and Steinvoids have done, what you will find is that the disk stays at n equals 1, while the, 
the rest of the galaxy, you know, I mean, the inner parts. I have a, I have a plot in a second, in fact, to show exactly that. So, I mean, qualitatively, you see, obviously, the, the you know, the, the, the dominant new thing happening is the central uh, stellar concentrations are happening. In fact, that's what you actually are asking. So here, here we have the, the surcage index in log units as a function of stellar mass. This is for the star formers in this 3D HSD catalog of Van Dockums et al. And this is for the, the, the quiescent population. So we know in the quiescent population and under high masses up here, uh, you know, there are fairly steep uh, cuspy profiles, 0.2, 0.4, 0.5 in log n uh, surcage, while in the star forming population, you see you start here at one in, in surcage index, right? But then as you go to higher mass, all of a sudden you start growing and almost meeting that point. And that's that point where you're growing bulges. So you're seeing you're, 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 you're moving up. If we break it, that's all the same. This is, point <laughs> eight, this is average 0.8 to 2.6 doesn't change much with redshift. I mean, the, qualitatively, it's, it's, this is the same. So clearly there is, as a function of mass, a cuspier central profile developing, and that's the central part of the galaxy. Here are the kinematic profiles. So this is with uh, KMOS, uh, where we take H alpha. Well, so what you're seeing here are the velocity fields. Uh, so red is redshifted and blue is blue shifted. And when you see a regular change like this, then that's an indication for a regular velocity field-like rotation. Uh, now, in, in, in more detail, which I can't give you here, of course, you, you may have a set of criteria you require for something to call a rotating galaxy, where this is the minimum you want to see, which is a velocity gradient. But you can generate velocity gradients also through non-rotation, so there are higher order criteria. But the answer is, that if, depending on what, what you actually, what your criteria are, between 70 and 90 percent of these high redshift objects uh, are in fact dominated by rotation. Is there uh, a correlation between the septic index and uh, rotation? It doesn't seem like there is, it seems like all of them are rotating, even the ones with the bulk. Yes. So how are we going to reconcile this bulk due to rotation? Well, we need, we, first of all, let's be very, very certain that if there's a compact bulge uh, and it would do something else than rotate, hmm? uh, you may not really see that on these images because the resolution here is not good enough unless the bulge is really dominant to, to see something. So we have to be a little careful. But in reality is uh, where we have better information, well, the bulges are forming from the disk and have probably a similar kinematic profile. So that, evolution of the that's the, we don't call it secular evolution. Violent disk instability is the word in the field, uh, but yes. And, and so in that sense, uh, one of the issues we are, will be, we cannot yet, but will be addressing is, are all of these bulges rotating perhaps rapidly? Yeah, so. Uh, these would not be pseudobulges. Uh, pseudobulges are bulges because they are really peanut shaped. I mean, that's sort of the definition of local universe. And so then, then they are disk process, and the disk, of course, is thin. Here, that those disks are so thick that they are pseudobulges in that sense, but you wouldn't notice it kinematically because they're so, the scale height is so large to start with. So there are not the bulges we see at very low edges. <laughs> okay, so then, then we come to another question, of course. What happens to those guys? Now, of course, those up here, as I said, they have a very high probability to, uh, to go down and uh, disappear in various parts of uh, quiescent modern galaxies as zeros and, and ellipticals, right? Or become bulges of modern galaxies. So that's certainly a possibility, but... Uh, no, we should see, we should see that. In, in, in fact, when I talk about the thick population here, the, there is a very strong connection here between these early first disks and the thick disk population of the low redshift universe, which is becoming now a real uh, intense uh, item of study. Yeah? So in principle, all of these are rotating, or the vast majority look like they are. Yeah, so I mean, as I said, 
<laughs> uh, we can go through this uh, depending on how you, uh, to what level of torture you want to go. Uh, the higher level of quality, of course, then you have to, you're going down. So this is mid-level where you require, for instance, definitely a, a smoothly changing uh, first moment map and that the second moment map has a peak in the center, okay, and that that peak in the center is co-located with the continuum peak, which you would call the center, the bulge, okay? But there, there is higher orders, which is, you know, do you see these curvatures, which are called spider diagrams? For that, you need typically either bigger systems or higher resolution. Where you can do it, you do see the, but you do sometimes see deviations from that too. What are the deviations? Is that because of perturbation? Is it because you have deviations from circular motion? So there are complications here. So this is the first order picture, but 70% I think most people would agree to. So it's... <coughs> and one other question about the kinetic. There's no way to identify the outflows here, right? Because they're not... Uh, the what? The outflows. Uh, they're not significant, not enough light. No, no, we will come to them. We'll come, abs absolutely. Yeah, unless I run out of time, which I worry. Uh, you can go as long as you I mean, know. I mean, yes, this is one of the, I'll, I'll, I give you a preview. I give you a preview. I will tell you that between 70 and 90% of objects in this mass range have nuclear outflows. Yeah? That's, that's sort of the preview. You can see from this, from this. Not from this. No, you have ah, to look at, in the, you, you have to look at spectrum. Ah, okay. I was asking specifically here. You cannot identify the outflows. <coughs> yeah, I mean, okay, what, 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 what? From the map itself, well, I mean, you're fitting a Gaussian here, and you're only plotting the location of the Gaussian. So the outflow would enter the second moment. Okay. Right? So, but then the second moment, okay, on most of these galaxies is dominated by the beam smearing of the rotation, okay? You have to take that out, and then you have to look in the center and say, is there a component of a wide component underneath all of this which cannot be explained by beam smeared rotation? And that's what I will talk about, yeah? <coughs> okay, so let's talk about angular momentum. So we all know that the dark matter has a log normal distribution of angular momentum parameter uh, uh, around about 0.04. Okay, so that's that all, all the simulations show that. And, and the question is now, what do the baryons do? So this is the first time we've been able to actually do this. Uh, this is a paper which we are just preparing here, by, um, led by Andy Burkert. So we now actually have 300 galaxies for which we can determine uh, the angular momentum parameter in the baryons on a scale of the disk scale, okay? And what do we find? Well, it's a log normal distribution with a mean lambda of 0.033. So that's interesting. So the baryons do have about the same mean angular momentum parameter as the dark matter. So the first conclusion you might have, oh, angular momentum is conserved. And then, of course, Simon White, if he were here, or Estacio or <laughs> Fall would all say, well, I told you this 25 years ago. Why, why did you worry about this? Uh, well, actually, this, this, we're not so sure whether this just straightforward means baryons are conserved or is it a, a mixture of gaining and losing, actually, and uh, so to speak, we are ending up in about the same uh, section. But that, that, is, that is the result we are having. Uh, to make sure I understand, if it's a rotating thing, this lambda is one. Yes. Right. right. So, so what? So what we're doing? Okay. I, uh, technically, again, <coughs> what we're doing technically here, we have a disk scaling, which we typically get from the HST imagery, n equals one. So we know it's an exponential disk. Uh, we have its scalings. We have a VC of the disk, right? Uh, we have also a sigma, which is dispersion. Uh, we have a mass, a stellar mass, and we have also a gas mass inferred, inferred from the star formation rate. So we had all of this, so we have a baryonic mass, Vc, sigma, and R. And then we fit an NFW halo to it. That gives us the halo mass. That gives us also the ratio of the baryons to the halo, which I come to next. And that then gives us lambda, right, because now we have the halo mass we have VC on this disk scaling, and that can, we can extrapolate. That's, that's how, how that is done. <coughs> I, I, 
I have a problem with this because this parameter basically it, it gives you how much rotationally supported you are in the dark matter. So if it's the same as the dark matter as the baryons, that means there has no, there has not been any baryonic contraction. No, no, no then you misunderstand me. This is the lambda of the dark matter in this in this galaxy inferred with from NF the from the baryons inferred with an NFW model, okay? Yes, I mean, so the, the galaxy on the galaxy scale, on the baryonic scale, is centrifugally supported, that, that's sure, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm with you, I'm with you, yes. So now, actually, there one very interesting thing in, in here, you know, if you go the other way around, and you assume that the dark matter was 0.035 for all of them, uh, you can actually do a different game, which is something which uh, Fall and Romanovsky have played uh, for local galaxy, where you can infirm, infer from the observed angular momentum. So that's just V times R or MV times R of the disk. Uh, the amount of uh, a specific angular momentum in the disk relative to that of the dark matter. And that's an important parameter because that tells you something about dissipation processes we might be interested in. So uh, without, again, going into the details here, uh, zero here, since it's log units, means in, in fact JD over J dark matter is one, which is what everyone, uh, you know, Mo, Mao, and White, and so forth, always have been assuming. So here's your zero line. Let's look first at the local universe. It would be this galaxy in the local universe are these red rectangles. Hard to see a little bit because you know, not emphasized here, but in fact, Fall and Romanovsky in their papers, following up on Fall's earlier papers, say, well, actually, for modern disks, not SAs, but SBCDs, in fact, sort of look like that. They, they have, you know, they have seem to have more conserved most of their uh, angular momentum in the disk and have not lost it. <laughs> While if you go to ellipticals and, and S zeros, which are these symbols down here, this pink, uh, purple uh, symbol, they are way down here. So I mean, factor of three or four down or five down. So clearly there has been dissipation because of the bulge formation and all this. So how does that look at the high redshift? So that's the blue. So, so those galaxies which are below a certain mass density, we, we painted blue here. And they're all happily sitting up here. So that's, in a way, mirroring this here, which is that they seem to indeed have conserved their angular momentum. But then, if you go to the more massive systems which have high, which according to a so-called so Barrow criterion, are above a certain density, stellar density, we've painted these green. And you see all of a sudden there is something is happening here at high masses. And, and, and you know, qualitatively, you've seen already what that is. It's the bulge formation, right? So you have to have significant amount of dissipation of angular momentum in the disk, which then gets you down here. So you see this at high mass, this process here dynamically, which, which, which removes angular momentum and brings stuff in. Uh, let me skip the, the Middle Easties uh, behind here. Now, another important question is, you know, how baryonic dominated are those galaxies? We know in the local universe, everyone would agree that on the disk scalings, or say 2.2 times the disk scalings, R1 half, <coughs> most heavy galaxies are baryon dominated, mm -hmm. yeah, more or less. You go to the lighter uh, dwarf systems and so forth, then they're dark matter dominated. But as you go out beyond a few scale length, then, then the dark matter dominates. Here is an attempt to estimate uh, the ratio of uh, the total mass here inferred dynamically, okay, dynamically, relative to the stellar and molecular gas content which we infer from the stars and the molecular gas, or rather from the star formation rate here through scaling relationship. So B is the, is the you know, basically the baryon fraction, and this is typically at R1 half, so 2.2 scaling. And so here you see the distribution, it's a log distribution again. It's a very large scatter, which I'm afraid is due to systematics in our measurements, which we don't all fully understand. But as long as you believe the center, you find a number of 0.85. So that seems to be a very well established number. We have been finding this now with increasing statistical accuracy. And, and so that says that 
were this number here in a, in, a, in a modern galaxy would be more like 0.3 or something like this. These galaxies are definitely strongly baryon dominated at R1 half. We have even uh, beginning to have rotation curves beyond this now. We are working very hard on this with stacking. So we have hundreds of galaxies now and we are uh, normalizing their radii and velocities and then are stacking the profiles to look how the, the rotation curves beyond, go beyond uh, uh, R1 half. Now you probably know in the local universe that's more or less flat, out to 50 kiloparsecs, and then it drops a little bit to the halo scale. Here we're beginning, think, we're beginning to see a very significant drop. Uh, embarrassingly so. So th this is how the Milky Way would look like on this scale. This would be a model where you take, um, you know, a, a, an exponential disk plus an NFW halo taking into account the expected lower concentration parameter at high redshift. And that would give you not as much of a, of a flat profile. But we seem to be falling off still further. In fact, almost Keplerian. If that turns out to be true, and we need, we need to confirm that, obviously, that means that probably adiabatic contraction is not working of the halo, and, and there must be an edge to the disk. So as if there is sort of a, a sharp outer edge. This has been seen at low redshift as well, interpreted to come about because of interactions and or you know, angular momentum, uh, uh, basically a, 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 an edge in the angular momentum distribution. So, you know, we are pushing out there now into the dark matter regime. That's, that's the new thing. That's the message I'm getting across. But you see, this is very fresh material. It comes out in the paper probably in a few months. Now let me switch gears and go to the molecular world. So I've told you about stars. I've told you about star formation. Now I'm going to tell you about gas. Here too, there has been a, a small revolution taking place. Uh, about five, six, seven years ago, we were barely able to detect a redshift uh, two uh, star forming galaxy in CO when it was way above the main sequence as a, a bursty system. We are now in a situation already through <laughs> several surveys at the plateau of having 200 main sequence galaxies in this main redshift range. In addition, we have also dust detections for a similar number of galaxies. So we really are beginning to map out in the same stellar mass uh, uh, star formation rate plane as a function of redshift, the gas. And so this has been enormous, uh, enormous efforts led by Linda Tacconi and uh, at, at our institute together with other people in, in the ERAM community. And here I'm summarizing now the main findings. First finding is as you go back, back in redshift, uh, the gas fractions are going up uh, very, very strongly. So here uh, you see the redshift, and here you see the molecular gas fraction. And there's two techniques used. The CO technique, uh, the so-called conversion factors, is in blue. And then in red is the dust technique using the information from Herschel. Uh, and they give you more or less the same output, which is rather remarkable. And the point is uh, that, the that the molecular gas fraction in the local universe of massive disks is about 7%. And here you are at 60% at, at redshift 2. Uh, I should say, what about H1? Uh, we cannot me measure H1, okay? Not yet. Um, it may not play an important role, we think. We have evidence from Lyman alpha absorption that, in fact, the Lyman alpha uh, absorptivity uh, it does not increase. So that, that does look as if the modern galaxies, which are dominated by H1, certainly in their outer parts, that may not be what the high redshift galaxies look like, probably because of the higher pressures and higher column densities converting very rapidly the ionized incoming gas into molecular gas. That, 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 that is at least the, the interpretation so far. But experimentally, we will have to wait, wait until SKA to be able to measure the equivalent H1 columns here uh, at this redshift. So. The John Meter telescope. The what? Who is the Indian giant? Uh, it's not really to be perfectly honest, I mean, the kind of stuff you just saw and you will be seeing from ALMA, which is 
I hope, within a few years, uh, rotation curves to 20 kiloparsecs, 30 kiloparsecs in molecular gas, or as we do now already in H-alpha. Even the SKA can't do that. It's, it's, it's very, I mean, 1.4 gigahertz is a long wavelength. H nu is very small, it's very difficult, although these machines are very sensitive. Um, now the gas fractions, or in this case, the ratio of molecular gas to stellar mass, depends on parameters, uh, most strongly on the offset uh, from the main sequence. So in fact, I mean, the way we now parameterize everything is we, we separate basically the uh, dependencies on redshift, uh, stellar mass, and star formation rate, basically, as the main parameters which we can currently explore. There will be other parameters. Environmental density, of course, being one of, one of them. The fraction of the bulge mass. And so all of this will come. But currently, we can explore redshift, uh, the offset in this, uh, relative to, this, to the main sequence line, which is really the good quantum number here, and then stellar mass. And so the finding here is that independent of whether you use CO, which are the blue points, or dust, which are the red points, we find a very strong dependence of gas fraction as you cut vertically in the stellar mass star formation rate plane. So you go up in the specific star formation rate plane from the main sequence line, and the gas fractions increase. That's not unexpected, but I mean, that's certainly what, what, what we find. The next number, which is... Uh, yes, you can. And, and in fact, I should say, uh, if, if we look at... Let's, let's look at that plot, and then we go talk Kennika Schmidt. So another uh, quantity in here which is important is the so-called depletion time scale, or one over the efficiency of star formation rate. So you have the molecular gas mass, you have a star formation rate, and that gives you a time over which, unless you have uh, further accretion, the gas gets exhausted. Okay? Uh, now that, that, of course, tells you, given your current star formation rate, how efficiently you're producing stars. I mean, that's, that's another way of saying this. So one of the findings here, again, independent of whether you use dust or, or CO, is that this depletion time scale as a function of redshift is fairly slow, slow there's a fairly slow variation. Uh, something like uh, 1 plus z to the minus 0.5 or something like this. Fairly slow. Unexpectedly so sh slow, I should say, actually. Very slow. That means, if you like, the mean star formation process could not have changed very much over cosmic time on the main sequence. On the main sequence. Very important. As you go above the main sequence, that changes. So now we come to Kennecott Schmidt. So here, this is the plot as a function you're cutting now perpendicular to the main sequence at all redshifts after you've taken out the redshift dependence. And again, independent of whether you take the blue or the red points, you would agree with me there is a very strong slope. What does that slope tell you? It tells you that above the main sequence, here are the above the main sequence, this is on the main sequence, above the main sequence, uh, your, your depletion time scale is much smaller, or the efficiency of star formation is much higher. So if you take a bunch of galaxies at any redshift you like, which you've selected somehow, with a range a, in specific star formation rate, you will find a nonlinear kennicutt schmidt law. Right? Because at any uh, depletion time scale in the relationship between gas and star formation rate is a 45 degree line. It's constant depletion time. But if the depletion time varies so strongly, as you go above the main sequence, you get more and more efficient, smaller, and therefore, you know, the, the combination looks nonlinear. So this, this uh, dependence is very interesting because it does tell us that in addition to the gas fractions, there is another effect here, which is probably the fraction of dense gas. That's been suspected at low redshift for some time. Uh, through density tracers as you go above the main sequence, which is this uh, horizontal axis, the HCN tracing dense gas to CO ratio increases. And that's interpreted to mean the fraction of dense gas above the main sequence, so to speak, is higher, probably because of compression. So again, the summary then is, if you have your main sequence, you go up at a given stellar mass, two things happen simultaneously, more gas fraction, 
and at the same time more efficient star formation. Now, let's go back to uh, the, the Q issue. Um, I, uh, you should really tell me when, when, when I should stop. I mean, I, uh, five, five minutes? Yeah. Five minutes, OK. <laughs> then I will skip this because you want to hear about outflows. Um, I will skip this and go to the outflows. Right. So we see the outflows. Uh, with broad wings underneath the narrow gas. So in this galaxy I, saw you, uh, I showed you before, uh, we take spectra into the individual points, and you would agree with me there is something very broad here underneath. And so you can map, actually map that out with an integral field spectrometer and see that this broad stuff is associated with individual clumps. So the, the first, what the first thing we are learning is there's an outflow component with a so-called mass loading around unity. Um, which is associated with individual clumps. So this is the star formation rate feedback. There it is. Everyone knows about this. Supernovae plus radiation uh, uh, pressure plus uh, H2 region effects, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's what that is. And this is what you see then in ultraviolet absorption lines as blue shifted uh, magnesium 2 or, or whatever. So they, they, they get launched not unexpectedly in these giant and these giant clumps, and we can, in agreement with the absorption line work, show that the mass loading factors are high. So that means for a galaxy to evolve along the main sequence, you have to input gas into the galaxy at about four times the, or three times the, the growth rate in order to keep it in equilibrium, right? Because most of it goes back out. And here is the new thing. And that would be then my last point, which is, do we see the AGN feedback? Now, the AGN feedback has been seen in individual QSOs. So what's new? Uh, here we're looking at objects only selected on the basis of their presence on the main sequence as a function of stellar mass and redshift. So here uh, is a bunch of galaxies for which we have superb spectra. And so then uh, we analyze these galaxies in the sense that we take out the rotation. Yeah, we fit the rotation out. And then we look at the residuals. And then we stack in, in, in bins in order to increase the signal noise ratio. So for instance, if we take this lower bin here, um, then here you see two profiles, actually, a, a, a blue line and a gray line. And that is the blue line is the inner parts of the galaxy. And the gray line is the outer parts of the galaxy. This is H alpha, and this is Nigen 2. You see the gray and the blue look like, and there's only narrow stuff. So there's not much going on. Now let's go to a slightly higher mass. Now you're beginning to see sort of a broad underlying thing. You see the gray and the blue is the same thing. So the interpretation is there's, there's something outflowing here because of this broad component. And it's the same in the disk and in the nucleus. I would call that star formation rate feedback. Number-wise, that has an outflow velocity of about 400 kilometers per second and is seen for all the higher density galaxies. Now let's go to a little higher mass, same picture. The, however, the, 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 this broad stuff becomes more prominent, but gray and blue, you would agree, looks about the same. Now look what happens now. Now in the highest mass bin above the Schechter mass, all of a sudden, the nucleus becomes very broad, asymmetric, in fact, Nigen 2, very strong. And the disk still shows this, but is not as broad. So what has happened here? Well, all of a sudden, and we see this in individual galaxies, which are very good, the broad component develops a nuclear uh, component. So this is a composite of H alpha narrow in green, and HST, the stellar part, and here the contours is the broad component. So that all of a sudden comes from the nucleus. You could not do that in several galaxies in a stacking sense. So basically what Natasha has done here is different apertures. And for each aperture, you see the profile. So now we're zooming in. OK, so let's start on the outside, relatively little broad. Now we go in, you see how this broad stuff grows. And then in the nucleus, all of a sudden, it's very strong in these galaxies. So we are seeing an outflow component, very high velocity, 
in the most massive systems, which only come from the nuclear regions. Right. I mean, it's just the gas which is bound. Ari, you must say that. I, I know that. <laughs> and, uh, 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 but then my answer to you is we know from the imaging surveys that if I plot the incidence rate of things, that depending a little bit on which survey you're talking about, in this high mass bin, uh, about 20% of the galaxies are called AGNs. So that's sizable. But the fraction of galaxies which show the outflow are between 70 and 90 percent. So what's wrong? It's low luminosity again. Yeah. Well, you, you and I agree. But I mean, formally, I would have to say we see that if you only select on the stable quantity, star formation rate and stellar mass, there is a point above 10.9 near the Schechter mass where all of a sudden nuclear outflows appear very high out flow velocities, very high strength, and with an incredibly high uh, duty cycle. Higher than <coughs> probably allowable by the AGN fraction, but then it's likely that the interpretation of that discrepancy is that the variable quantity, AGN, fluctuates all over the place, but the black hole is always accreting at some point, and we are just seeing that the steady part, which is on a kiloparsec scale, this outflow is driving. Okay? Also, the high velocities would be hard to explain at times. Oh, no, I'm, I'm with you on the black hole. Just be very careful because many people, when you, as soon as you say AGN, they say, oh, well, nothing is new. I, I hope you understand there is something new. 90% or 70% of these beasts are doing this all the time. And that means there is a chance here, if this couples to the gas, and so we need to look at molecular gas next, that this actually is driving out. And if you combine this with this radial in, 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 inflow due to the, to the uh, you know, secular evolution, that actually you know, stuff may be brought in and then you know, uh, thrown out. OK, well, I'm done. Basically, I, I, I know it's been a bit of a water hose treatment here, but uh, proudly I can say we've learned so much. I mean, so much has been coming out of this. Uh, different information on different sides, resolved in the in situ observations, outflows. I've not talked about morphological quenching. Didn't talk much. No, I didn't talk about metallicities or H2 region excitation, which all happens. I did talk about baryon fractions, velocity dispersions. I didn't talk about lambda. I did talk about zero. We are beginning to really address also the, the physical parameters in these high redshift galaxies. And together with the theoretical work, I do see a very nice convergence here toward an, a very believable physical picture. Thank you.